Hi everyone, I'm the director for our New Zealand NGO, Common Knowledge Trust, and this week we've been doing a COVID-19 free quick birth skills online course. And we really appreciate everybody who's listened. And the internet's both an amazing thing and very frustrating. Uh, you think you're reaching out and you may not be. So today we're going to talk about why growing a skilled birthing population is so important. So I'm going to refresh your memory, first of all, because we're living in a childbirth trend that started between my two births. <laughs> so when I gave birth in 1970 in the United States, and to some extent in modern countries around the world, there was a childbirth trend that had followed on before the first one, which was the post-World War II, which was more women going into the hospital, follow your doctor's orders. But in the 60s and 70s, there was a wave of people who were beginning to think that childbirth was becoming too medicalized in, as, as a standard of care, and that many women could birth without that medical care. And so three very famous obstetricians developed the first ever perception that women could be skilled to birth their baby. It was Lamaz, Bradley, and Grantley Dick Reed, or Childbirth Without Fear. And what they did was they developed at that point, because there was no internet, classes. They trained people to teach classes. And these were the very first childbirth preparation classes taught around the world and in modern countries. And so there was a very high societal expectation. And that's important because that's what we're going to talk about. It's why your birth impacts our societies and global societies. So when I and my husband attended a Lamaze class in 1970, we were one of multiple millions of families from the 60s to the 70s who learned birth skills, which meant that we went into the hospital where there were assessments, monitoring procedures. I was shaved. I was given an enema. I couldn't eat. I couldn't walk. I couldn't drink. I was flat on my back with feet in stirrups and a an episiotomy, and my baby was taken to a nursery, and I was in the hospital for 10 days, and breastfeeding wasn't um, pushed. Babies were given uh, sugar water at first or, or formula. So that's in 1970 in the United States what the assessments, monitoring procedures were. They didn't have IV drips. A cesarean was 4.5%. It was major abdominal surgery. Fathers were permitted in with us, and we used skills, which meant that labor and delivery nurses and obstetricians saw multiple millions of skilled women. The skilled women were coping better because childbirth has always been divided into two elemental areas. Women suffering in childbirth, which meant they weren't coping with the natural occurring pain of contractions, and whether there were issues or risks that were going to become a problem. And there is no dichotomy or there's no extreme between natural, easy, good outcome, and death. There is a continuum of issues in between. So when I gave birth in the 70s, there was this very high societal expectation. Sadly, the emphasis of the skills were on those low-risk normal births to achieve a natural birth, pain-free labor with no medical care. So the labor and delivery nurses and obstetricians were, were evaluating the skills to those goals rather than evaluating the skills to what would have been the more appropriate goals, which was to give 100% of pregnant women who will birth 100% of the time one way or another the ability to cope and manage through the activity of birthing their baby. So there were two pathways. The one pathway, 100% of pregnant women should be skilled. 100% of pregnant women will give birth. 100% of births is an activity that women are doing. And 100% of 
birthing women doing the activity will birth better with a set of skills. That was one pathway that was not followed. That's what our NGO and what I have spent 50 years trying to say. The pathway that was followed was that skills were for low risk, normal pregnancies with the goal of producing natural births, pain-free labor without medical care. That pathway, that idea, those words, the actions that followed, the systems that developed followed that pathway. And we are here today because this pathway was followed, which excluded the vast majority of women, which focused on a tiny percent of people and almost have made it impossible, even within that group, to succeed. And we saw the lack of success of that idea and those words back in the 70s because not enough women who were low risk and normal, theoretically, because nobody defined the word normal. Now, I shouldn't really say that. They defined it to mean safe and easy. They didn't define it to mean what it has always meant, which is anything that might happen, that could happen at a birth, may happen. So when you take away medical care, normal has a vast range of stuff, natural and normal, good or bad, easy or challenging, successful or tragic. So when that word normal got extracted out to imply low risk, there was no guarantee that a woman who was defined as low risk would actually have a low risk birth or that she would cope with a natural occurring pain because the risks may not be in her health or the baby's health. It may be that she just doesn't know that she has internal tension in her body that is preventing this baby from coming down through and out her body easily. And then she may end up with a very long labor. So between my birth in 1970 and my last one in 1982, the trend changed because the next group of natural birth advocates came along and said, see, skills don't achieve those narrow goals, and therefore skills are not essential for women to have. And that was actively promoted. Cows and cats aren't taught to birth. Women don't need to learn to birth. It was it perceived as an insult that women needed to birth. In fact, famous authors would say, Women birth instinctively. They know how to birth because women have always birthed. So women need to be left alone to discover birth by themselves, which is funny because we wanted our husbands <laughs> with us at birth because in the generation after the Second World War to the late 60s, we were left alone. <laughs> and we wanted someone to come and help us because we lacked skills. So... What changed in the early, the late 1970s and 80s was skills were dismissed. And that was the second problem. Remember the pathway, 100% of women give birth, 100% of women should be skilled, that skills should be focused on women not suffering or able to cope better throughout the activity they're doing. Remember that pathway that got ignored? Well, let's say it was ignored and suddenly People had picked it up and said, yeah, but we see women coping better. Labor and delivery nurses, obstetricians, midwives see skilled women coping better. Good idea. Let's join that with our next trend, which is that women should have the right to say no to medical care or the choice-based trend we're in now. Imagine that. Imagine if skills and choices had come together from my generation to my children's generation to their children's generation, which is today. Imagine that, but that didn't happen because this other pathway that was focused very narrowly on low-risk women using skills to achieve a natural birth, pain-free labor with no medical care, that didn't exist. So skills were dismissed and then choices were put in place. So those women just need to say no to medical care. And the words medical assessment 
monitoring and procedures were lumped into one word called interventions. And the implication of interventions then became they're imposed on women and unnecessary. So women were then supposed to say no to all types of medical assessments, monitoring procedures. And when our trust teaches workshops to birth workers and we ask particularly midwives, what does your profession want? They want more natural births. What's stopping that? Interventions. Let's list interventions. There's a list, a common list of 28 interventions that range from not being able to eat or drink, not being able to walk, not, you know, having all the assessments, monitoring procedures that I had or different ones, you know, not having your membrane stripped, not having your water bag broken, not having drugs, not having the episiotomy, not having a forceps, not having a cesarean, so on and on and on. So we, as women, are saying to each other as women, to achieve this ideal birth, first of all, you have to be low risk, which is perceived of as having no health issues at all, which many of us do, whether it's asthma, or whether we're living in an abusive relationship, or there's substance abuse. So it's very, very complicated. And your birth fits into this. And this is what's so profound is that choice for place skills, we're still in a choice-based system, but with COVID-19, choices aren't always available to women. And because they lack skills, they're more frightened. So what happens in childbirth for you? You perceive of your pregnancy and your baby's birth as just yours. And it is. My pregnancy and my children's births were just mine. I really didn't care how you had your baby. It wasn't a topic of conversation when you met on the street. Hi, how was your birth? Right? So we don't talk to each other that way, yet we put this huge emphasis on birth. And as women, we do it in a mean-spirited way. A hundred percent of us are going to give birth. A hundred percent of us do this activity of birthing our baby. You would think that 100% of women who are pregnant and birth, who have birth, would have just admired another woman who had doing the activity of birthing her baby. No matter where she birthed, no matter who was present, no matter her circumstances, no matter her beliefs, no matter her choices or lack of choices, and no matter what happened to her around her. But that has not grown into the conversation. The conversation has grown with the meanness that women have to one another. I had a home birth, you had a cesarean. And we know this meanness, but it extends into our own families. She was my home birth, he was my cesarean. Do you think your children really care? And I know there's been all this research, breastfeeding is best, natural birth is best, Vaginal births is best because of the biomes. We understand that. However, if we're going to do that about childbirth, then we need to take that into environment. Why are we driving a car? We know it has pollution. Why are we using plastic? It pollutes. Why are we using chemicals in our homes that we know can damage us? So on, on the one hand, birth has become segregated out of the rest of the world and the implication is that we have to have this perfect birth. And there is considered to be an ideal birth. And that is at home, in water, being left alone with a midwife, who, as a famous midwife said, sits in a corner and knits. And as a famous other author, the woman is left alone to discover birth. That's the ideal birth. And in fact, what we see on YouTube often are births in which women are coping well. And often we only see the birth of the baby. We don't actually see the activity that women do. We certainly don't see the activity of women driving to the hospital, being prepped, and lying there for an extended period of time while they have a cesarean. We don't even in our minds think to ourselves, geez, if I had some breathing and relaxation skills, if I had prepared my body for birth and just enjoyed it, I would feel more engaged at the present time. 
I feel that I was doing the activity of welcoming my child from my body into my arms. We don't think that way because the ideas back then in the 60s took us down the path we're in now, which is to disregard every single birth except the birth that we really consider to be ideal, rather than having grown the first pathway that was available, which was skills for all women in order to cope, manage, and work through the activity of birthing your baby. So how does this come back to you? If this is your first baby, you do not have a birth story to tell. If, like many of us, we've had one or more children, we remember our children's births, and we tell birth stories in certain circumstances. Not often and frequently, but in a lot of places, we do share birth stories. We often share them with our children about the day they were born. So we construct in our mind what that birth was like when we remember it, and we filter out a lot of it. So in the 50 years I've been involved in birth, I've been involved in birth globally for 50 years, so I have listened to tens of thousands of birth stories. And what became really apparent around the world was that birth stories had three components. All of them did. One component was a time factor, and that makes sense. You'll hear a woman say, well, my water bag broke at 11 p.m., or early in the morning I began to feel contractions, or the midwife came at 7 p.m., or we drove to the hospital at 2 in the morning. So it's a time frame, and that time frame goes on. It will say, I was fully dilated at 4 p.m., I pushed for two hours, or I only pushed for a few contractions, my baby was born at 6 o'clock in the morning. So if you read birth stories, which are on a gazillion forums in Facebook, you will hear that time element. It's all over birth stories. That's the story that people are telling about their birth. The other element is what they did or didn't do to me. And that can range from your partner, your midwife, your doula, the staff in the hospital, your care provider. And it can be a positive or negative story about what they did or didn't do to me. I wasn't permitted out of bed. They said I could, I couldn't. They made me do this. The, this care provider was rough when they did an internal. My partner was useless. I just hated having them around. Or it could sound like this. I couldn't have done it without my partner. He or she was wonderful. I hung on them for hours. Or my midwife, who I just loved during the birth, couldn't show up at the birth because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I wanted to have these choices, and things changed, but I wasn't consulted, so I feel traumatized. So the second element around childbirth is what they did or didn't do to me, and that's a large part of the story because of the choice-based method. When I gave birth in 1970, very few of my generation of women were traumatized by their birth. That does not mean that we did not have traumatic births or that we did not have bad outcomes or that we did not grieve. It means that we did not carry the shame, blame, guilt, disappointment, anger, frustration that so many women have now. Because once skills were pushed aside, women didn't have anything to rely on. They just had choices. And the way that choices were sold to women was through that ideal. Women know what kind of birth they want, so they should be able to tell their care providers that they want X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, J, J K, L, M, N, O, P, and that that care provider should provide the woman with what they want at their birth. And this is where messaging becomes illusionary. 
babies don't come to plan. There's no way to know what your birth is going to be like. Even if you think you want A, B, C, D, E, F, G, there are many, 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 many women who, when their birth unfolds, they don't want any of that, or they want this or that. That's why it's so hard for husbands or birth coaches to understand birth plans, because a woman might say, let's just use an example, I don't want any pain relief. And she gets into birth and she finds labor contractions, the natural occurring pain, really intense. And she has no skills. And as the contractions get more progressive and they get longer, um, stronger and closer together, she starts to want to have pain relief. But she has said on her birth plan, I don't want pain relief. Because that's an ideology. The ideology is I want a natural birth. I don't want pain relief. If I have pain relief, that I'm not having a natural birth. But birth is always natural. It follows naturally after pregnancy. So every birth is natural. We can't get out of pregnancy unless we give birth. So then the birth coach, her partner, or someone she cares about is saying, but you said that you didn't want pain relief, and you asked me to support that choice of yours. And the woman glares at him and goes, you're not doing this. And then they cave and say, okay, I understand, you're doing this, you want pain relief now, and six months later, that woman's pissed off at that person. And this is why not having skills as a societal, strong societal message that it's natural and normal self-learned skills in pregnancy, and use those skills through the activity of birthing your baby, why we need to now bring that up and have a new childbirth trend. We must grow a skilled birthing population because choices aren't reliable, they're variable, and nobody understands them. Women don't even understand them. So, because we have to do the activity of birth, it's not planning an activity that we're passive to. So, the elements of birth stories are one is time, when things didn't, didn't happen, what they did and didn't do to me. And that's often around the birth choices. And the third element is what women experience. So often they'll say, beginning of the labor, when I knew I was in labor, the contractions weren't very strong. Then they became stronger. So she's telling you what's happening to her, how she's perceiving the experience. Then they got very painful. Then I lost the plot. Then I screamed or I moaned or I was a good little girl and I became very quiet or I had terrible back labor or I pushed and pushed for hours or the blood vessels in my eyeballs popped or on and on and on and on, right? Or I had such an intense labor, I thought I was going to die or I labored for 72 hours, right? So this is all about a woman's personal experience. So <clears throat> there are these three elements. They are across the board in every single birth story you read or listen to or watch on YouTube. There is one element missing because back then when there was a high societal expectation that everybody attend these first childbirth classes, which were skills only because we had no choices, and we went into the hospitals with all these assessments, monitoring, and procedures, and used these beginning skills. Multiple millions of women coped better. And when my generation talks about our birth, we do include time. We don't include what they did and didn't do to us because it was just part of the package, really. We didn't have any expectation that a labor and delivery nurse was nice to us or not nice to us or that our obstetrician included us in decision making. So that was not part of our birth stories. And what, what we felt often was, you know, like a terrible nagging back labor and the it lasted between contractions, things like that. But we talked about the skills we used even though they weren't great. So we would say, you know, the breathing, we really focused on our breathing. Our husband breathed with us. I really tried to relax. 
my husband kept lifting my arm to see if I was relaxed. So my generation that was infused in skills where multiple millions of women and men were skilled working together as a team, the obstetricians and labor and delivery nurses saw that, except they had already been primed to believe that the goal wasn't about coping better, working together better, managing better, that the goal was to achieve this natural birth without medical care and a pain-free labor. So we have to understand that ideas that have language put to them have to produce the goal, have to produce the results. So if the idea back then had been 100% of pregnant women will give birth, it's an activity everybody does, everybody should have skills, the results would have shown that that's true, that when women are skilled, they birth better, they cope better, they manage better, they have better birth stories after the birth, regardless of what happens to and around them. But because the goals were very narrow to achieve this, they haven't existed. So the systems are changing because they're keeping the same goals. And that's a huge mistake. And now we're in COVID-19. What can people expect? Well, they've just done a study in a New York hospital, which is one of the hot spots for this cluster. And they're finding out that upwards to 20% of women are testing positive who are coming into labor and delivery, but they're asymptomatic. So that means that the care providers around them have to take extra precautions. So, and often the hospitals are now saying nobody can come in with them or only one person. Don't you think that people would be more confident and less frightened and more able to cope and manage if there had been a skilled birthing population and it had grown through these generations, we know that that would be true. And it's sad to us that it's not true. We can't make up for the stupidness of what occurred. We can't make up. And it was stupid because people knew women suffered. People knew that was the bigger issue rather than life and death. That was the much bigger issue. And we also knew that modern people had a very high expectation that the medical profession would prevent the risks that become problems. We demanded all of the changes in modern maternity care. Modern maternity care didn't come up with the changes. We demanded them, and I've talked about that in the previous classes, because I lived through that demand. So I know that's accurate. Right? So it's really important for people to understand that right now in COVID-19, if we self-learn skills, and thankfully you can do it online, we had to go to classes. All those classes would be canceled. You can't go into a library and get a book now but you can go online and learn birth skills. That's why our NGO created this quick COVID course so that you could go through it more quickly. Yet we didn't want to leave out any of the areas. We wanted to include the breathing, the communication, the touch, all of the body preparation. We wanted to make certain that both you and hopefully the person who's going to be with you can share these skills together. But there are other online skills courses. You need to learn skills. You need to put out of your brain the choices and understand that you are doing this activity. The word doing or giving birth are weak verbs, as I've talked about before. Coping is not a weak verb. What are you going to do to cope? What skills are you going to put in place to cope? What skills are you going to put in place to manage while you do the activity of birthing your baby, whether you are doing it with or without medical assessments, monitor, and procedures, including a surgical birth? This is your baby's birth. You got pregnant to have a baby, not a birth. It's an activity. 
if you work through this activity, what skills are you going to use? If you deal with the things that happen to you around you, what skills are you going to use? If you want to stay on top of the sensations you have or the experiences that happen when there are assessments, monitoring procedures, what skills are you going to use? If you want to feel in control throughout the activity of birthing your baby, what skills are you going to use? That's important. We need to grow a skilled birthing population, which means that what happens after your birth is that you will have a fourth element in your birth story, and the more important one, you will tell people what skills you use. But we have to then go on to what's more important than just saying, I breathed, I focused on my breathing, or I relaxed. You have to be able to have skills that can pass on to your sons and daughters. We pass on cooking skills. <laughs> we don't pass on how to be a good lover. We can pass on how to drive a car. We do pass on what foods are safe or what's safe to put into our mouth or not. Those are physiological processes. So it's important, and that's why birthing better skills are so unique, is they're based on our shared human body experience. So you want to have a good birth story. It's important. And that birth story will often come from the skills that you've used. And this is important also for the person who's going to be with you. We know that doulas have developed since the 1990s, and they did that because of what happened in the 60s and 70s when the goals for skills were focused on low-risk normal pregnancy and birth to achieve this um, normal birth, pain-free labor without medical care. At that point, fathers were considered to be birth coaches. Bradley was called husband coach childbirth or father coach childbirth. Lamaze was also grantly degreed. There was a coach with you. They helped you cope. They helped you manage. They helped you feel in control. But the natural birth advocates of the 70s who dismissed skills then said, father shouldn't be a birth coach. You don't want a father standing on the sideline going, push, 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 because that was an insult to this idea that women instinctively know how to birth. So they renamed the role of the father to be a birth support, that a husband or a father or a partner or somebody else should just support women's choices. But as I said earlier, that became very complicated right away because women are very fickle about their choices and change their minds easily, and then nobody can keep up with them. And they come up with long lists. And even with trying to streamline the list, they're long lists. I mean, is it important for a woman in hindsight that the baby was laid on her belly right away? Was it more important that she didn't lie on her back to have a vaginal exam? Was it more important that she wasn't separated from the baby when the baby was given an exam? Was it more important that she had an epidural only at the last moment? What was more important? We didn't know. We never knew. And women never knew until hindsight. So we need to understand that for the, a birth coach or a person who's with you to be told to support a woman's choices, then the idea is you're supporting the choices a person is making before the activity and you don't know how to support it if it changes during the activity. So they were also removed from being a coach to protect the sacred space of birth. And this is where it's all been so crazy. The idea in the natural birth movement is women have to feel safe in order to birth because these hormones arise. Well, that has no reality in the world. They're throughout time. Women have birthed in war or famine. They've birthed in natural disasters, in poverty. 
in, in, in abuse. It, it, women, at the end of pregnancy, you give birth, whether you're in an ideal situation or not. So the idea that women had to have their sacred space of birth protected and that animals go off by themselves to birth, you know, honestly, you know, some animals do go off by themselves, but we're human beings. And when women went off by themselves to birth, they birthed by themselves without anybody else there. So then if we use the equation does a cow gather her sisters around her when she births? Some of the herd animals do. We're not really a herd animal, right? We're humans, and we have this mind, and we think. Would we love to have a perfect birth place? <laughs> you know, that's reserved for people in modern cultures who have the wealth enough to do that. When I work with very religious families that have 10 to 20 children, they can't wait to go to the hospital to have a break. So we have to understand that when the birth coach is set up to fail as supporting choices and protecting the sacred space of birth, we've set up the family to fail in the future because the woman then has an expectation of her her partner, and when that partner fails, she will shut him out when the baby is born. We know this because we hear this from both men and women. If the partner didn't have the skills to help in a birth, he knows he was useless and helpless. She knows he was useless and helpless and disappointed her. And when she has to then take care of the baby, she doesn't want his fumblingness to intrude on her needing to get the activities done. So she pushes him away. And we hear again and again and again, 18, to two years, 18 months to two years later, I'm taking care of two babies. I don't need that. And the relationship disintegrates. But imagine if in the 60s and the 70s we had used skills to focus on the coping, the managing, the doing the work of birth, and that the birth coach was equally skilled, and that the families worked together as a team, as we did, even with the primitive skills of Lamaze and Bradley and Grantley Dick Reed. If that had continued to evolve, even with choices, if we had grown and evolved skills as birthing better has evolved skills so that you can prepare your body from 24 weeks onward and do the internal work from 32 weeks onward. And the partners can understand the shared common set of skills to work together from these two very important roles, giving birth and coaching a woman, seeing and hearing and helping her feeling control. If two human beings, regardless of the gender, are able to work through this activity together, and they come out on the other side, they work together as parents or family for this child. And the doula profession for birth workers of doula is developed because fathers were removed from that primal role. I'm not against doulas. I'm fine with as many people you want at a birth. Don't get me wrong as the director of a trust. This, our NGO is not saying doulas should not be at births. What we're saying is that the primary birth coach should be the person who's going to remain in that child's life because that's where skills matter. And if you're fortunate to have a doula, then just teach them the skills you're learning because that primary birth coach wants a break. You can't take a break. If you have a four-hour labor, nobody needs to take a break. You start to have a seven-hour labor, they need to go to the toilet, or they may need to eat. Or if you have a 12, 24, 36, 48-hour labor, you want to have more people who share the same set of skills with you. That's important. So having antenatal or birth doulas is great. 
But do you know where families really want help? Is after the birth. That's where postnatal doulas are. They have found their niche, and that's what should explode. But once again, when we have doulas and midwives, without a doubt, midwives and doulas particularly have focused on this ideal birth. They want to be around these beautiful births. And how do we know that? We know that because of the language that they say. The midwives will talk about their own profession. The midwives who work in the hospital, they call medwives. And midwives who do home birth, they consider to be the true midwife, the community midwife, the independent midwife, the ones who are attending these low-risk normal births, these beautiful births. But that isn't the reality of you or me or millions of other women birthing. We want our baby's birth to be dignified. We want the people who are around us at birth to dignify our birth experience. And so from our NGO, we would love to see more postnatal doulas because this is where nuclear families struggle. They'd love to have six weeks of someone to cook and clean and shop and take care of the kids and give you a break so that you can sleep. So if your husband has to go back to work, that he doesn't have to come home and cook and clean and shop and do the laundry. He needs to have the time to adjust to having this new human being in their, your family, just as you do. So we'd love to see more postnatal doulas, and we'd love to see within a skilled birthing population, doulas being working with you rather than taking the place of your husband or your other. So when you think about your birth, your birth is one of multiple millions that happen every year. But your birth matters because what you say to your sons and daughters, what you say to your friends and families, tells them what the society is passing on. <clears throat> so if you're saying to your sons and daughters, when I was pregnant with you, your father or other, we self-learned skills and we use those skills to work through giving birth to you. We want you to do the same thing. They will do the same thing. That's the path we wanted to see developed in the 70s. If, on the other hand, you say to them, you know, when I was pregnant with you, I really wanted this type of birth. I made a birth plan. I researched all the information. I spent a lot of time doing it, and it didn't unfold the way I wanted. What are you saying to your sons and daughters? The same story. What are you saying to your friends and relatives? One is skills. And so they carry forward that message to the people they talk to. I can't grow a skilled birthing population. Our NGO has been around for over 25 years. We can't grow a skilled birthing population. We're not found on the Internet. Now that we're doing live presentations, maybe we're more likely to be found. Our YouTube channel isn't visited very much. At the moment that I'm talking, there's nobody listening. So... We need all of you to want to become skilled to birth your baby, no matter where you birth, who's with you, the circumstances, your beliefs, your choices or lack of choices, or what happens to or around you. Because you will do this activity of birthing your baby. That's how you get out of pregnancy. And when you are skilled to do it, you actively engage in this phenomenally life-transforming gateway experience that you will remember the rest of your life. So you are setting yourself up in pregnancy to have a birth story that you remember. And right now, too many women have set themselves up because the childbirth trend and the message has set them up to fail. 
because they didn't get the birth they wanted and planned. So we need to go back to that beginning time. We need to heal the wound. We can do this. This is not rocket science. This is not hard. And technology has caught up to us so that we can now learn online in the privacy on our own home. So it's really important for you to understand your birth is one drop. The ripple effect is massive. If you have friends who are pregnant, you then become two drops or three drops. The ripple effect is massive. We talk about COVID-19 and its infection rate. It can infect two to three people, they think. And then every person of those infects two to three people. It's a virus and it's spreading. It's gone viral. We need the concept that it is normal and natural to learn, self-learn birth and birth coaching skills when you're pregnant and use those skills to birth your baby, no matter where you birth, who is present, your choices, lack of, what happens to or around you, or who's present. We need that to be viral. We need you to tell others. We need them to tell others. We need people on birth forums to tell others. We need birth forums to focus more on what we, the birthing families, can do for ourselves rather than focus on these little select groups like breech births. Breech birth is a birth. A breech baby is a breech baby. If you prepare your body and then use skills, how you birth your baby may be out of your control. Using skills is totally in your control. Vaginal birth after a cesarean. It's a birth. This is your baby's birth. Whether it unfolds the way you want, you have to do the activity of birthing your baby. Whether you labor and have a vaginal birth, which is a VBAC, whether you labor and have an unplanned or an emergency cesarean, it's your baby's birth. Keep using skills while being prepped and in surgery. Or a non-laboring cesarean, planned and wanted, or just so disappointed you feel you're going to grieve forever. Why would you grieve forever? You're birthing your baby. If you enjoy preparing your body for the birth because your body's still preparing for a vaginal birth and to labor, if you enjoy learning skills with your partner, if you commit to practicing and using your skills, you are birthing your baby with dignity and actively. It's your baby's birth. So we have on Facebook all these divided forums, but that's not true. What's true is 100% of pregnant women will give birth one way or another, and all of us can become skilled. So this is the end of our seven-day free COVID quick birth course. We want you to tell you seven days later, I mean, spend an hour a day with you. Not one person has purchased the course. We're going to keep it up. It's 60 US dollars with a 20% discount. So many of the birthing better skills are in the course. And all of the proceeds from that sale go to our NGO so that we can continue to try to heal the rifts and heal the primary wound that started when I gave birth, which was to focus on a small group of women with an ideal birth and to discount all the rest of us. Crazy. So we need to change our understanding, change our language, and change our actions. And that's very easy to do. Let's all become skilled and use skills to birth our babies and to have somebody who is helping us prepare at home because they're going to be in the baby's life and they want to become skilled and useful. And then if they're able to be with us, a shared set of skills so that you can work together as a team. So when you bring your baby home or have your baby at home, that together you will feel confident and continue to grow the intimacy of your family. And that then heals society. 
So thank you for listening to this course. You can come to our YouTube channel, and I'll put that link on all of these lessons. And any of you that are birth workers, our NGO wants to work with you to help you have this new language, have this new idea, have this new goal, which is to see families actively working through their baby's birth journey together. We will work with any birth workers who want to do that. We do not with work with birth workers who want to teach birthing better to their clients, nor do we work with birth workers who want to do the skills on their clients. We do not need better birth workers. We need a skilled birthing population, and that's what heals societies. So join us, and let's grow this new childbirth trend because we have this opportunity now with this virus to do so. Thank you very much.